Okay, my loves. I know there are a lot of you that are out there that are really wondering how do I even set boundaries anymore. Maybe you didn't grow up with great boundaries. Maybe boundaries weren't really modeled well for you. Or maybe you were told that you cannot have boundaries. Maybe you're tired of being gaslighted in your relationships and you're tired of feeling crazy all the time and guilty for trying to make a difference in your life. If this is you, then I want you to come schedule a call with me. Let's chat about the Unashamed Image Program. The Unashamed Image Program is geared towards you specifically. I am going to be helping you in our next upcoming session of the Unashamed Image. I am personally going to train you how to not feel crazy when someone is gaslighting you, how to be able to stand your ground, to keep your boundaries intact, and to also see through the bull crap. I am also going to be teaching you how to set really confident boundaries, boundaries that you can really rely on. And I'm going to help you communicate them in a way that really makes sense. Basically, I'm going to help you live a life free of shame and on your terms. If you are ready and you are done feeling all the shame and guilt for trying to set boundaries, if you are not willing to live another moment the way you are right now and in somebody else's shadow, then this is the time to schedule that call with me. It's completely free. No pressure. Just love. Just support. Go to www.erinandersonthetraumacoach.com. Scroll down the page to where it says, let's chat about working together. Click on that button and it'll take you to my booking page. If you're ready to live the unashamed life, schedule that call. Let's get you in the Unashamed Image program, my loves. From my heart to your heart. Bye. Hey, everyone. It's Erin Anderson with the Erin Anderson Betrayal Trauma Coaching. I am super excited that you have tuned in today. Let's get talking about how to heal from betrayal trauma. Welcome to the other side of the struggle. This is a podcast where we talk about trauma, how to heal it, and then how to take it and use it to unlock your mission and your potential and to use it to live your very best dream life. When you're dealing with betrayal trauma, it can be hard to know how to heal it, how to stop the pain, and to know what your next steps are to take in your own life. And these are the questions that we try to answer here. Trauma has the ability to rob us of our joy and identity, which is why it's so miserable to experience. But with the right tools and with the right mindset, we can totally reclaim that joy and even use the trauma to strengthen ourselves so that way trauma does not knock us off of our joy again. Living your dream life should be a non-negotiable, but trauma tends to try to negotiate that with you. And even though trauma is not something that we will completely ever be free of in our life, the pain is negotiable. This is why I created Erin Anderson Betrayal Trauma Coaching and this podcast is because I want my listeners, I want my clients to live, truly live free from the prison that trauma can put you in. I want you to live on the other side of the struggle.
Welcome back to another episode of The Other Side of the Struggle. And um, we have with us today a fabulous guest, uh, Markel Brown, and I have become recent but really good friends. And I've listened to her story and what she's trying to do as well. And I'm not going to spoil any of it for you guys because I know Markel can definitely tell it way better than I can. Um, but she's here to help betrayal trauma victims. She herself has experienced betrayal trauma, but she is not just a survivor. She's a thriver from it. She's found some beautiful, beautiful ways to heal. And as you guys have seen from the uh, the title of this podcast, you know, she's went from being, you know, in the jalapeno relationship to moving it down into a much more cooling position. And so I'm going to kind of step aside today. I'm going to let her kind of share her story um, and, you know, obviously give you guys some some content and, and some discussion because I really feel like Markel is going to give you guys just a fantastic episode today. So welcome, Markel. Thank you, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And although my story is pretty horrific, I really am excited about this work, helping women who have gone through betrayal trauma and providing them hope uh, that they can heal and recover and they can regain that spark of life and go from that victim to survivor into thriver. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, from thriving to, you know, confidence and believing in yourself and, and, and loving yourself to the point where you set really good boundaries no matter what. And, you know, like I and and people have heard me on this podcast talk about like the jalapeno. Right. And how I'm like most of the time when when you get into the in a, in a relationship with the jalapeno. Right. Most of the time those women end up leaving that relationship. And and I'm not saying and I still won't say, you know, that. You guys need to stay in that relationship, right? Because to me, I really feel like personal safety is key. And we don't want people to consistently be injured from, you know, the jalapeno in a physical way. But your story is a very different one. Yeah. And, you know, I really like that word jalapeno because that's what it felt like. Everything was always on fire and it seemed like everything that I would do just didn't make a difference. It didn't help, um, you know, cleaning the house and having that perfect, having dinners ready, you know, making sure the kids are all set. And so actually it has been just right at 10 years since my D-Day, which mine did involve domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And... It was horrible and it still brings heaviness, although I can talk about it and I don't really need to go into any of the specifics. Yeah. yeah. It um, and I also want to share that I really haven't talked about this a whole lot with very many people. My therapist, my bishop, I've shared it with you, I've shared it with a few people because most of the time when people are involved in domestic violence, there is a lot of shame. Yeah given towards the abuser and as well as the, the victim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the regards of the abuser, I knew that when all of this happened, that I wanted to save my marriage. I wanted to save my family. I had no idea in that moment how that was possible. And what I've learned over these past years is that when we do yoke with Christ, when we utilize the atonement of Jesus Christ, all things can be possible, even the impossible, even when we don't see any way out or how is it ever going to improve. And that is my message of hope is that if we can yoke with Christ, we really can overcome those seemingly impossible things. And it was a very, very long journey. And I was definitely shattered and broken and I was physically uh, injured. I was physically abused and I was severely injured. And 
that in itself, when you have the betrayal anyway, where the one that you love turns on you or does something that is totally out of alignment of their values and your own values, and I had no clue with that. So whether it's domestic violence or pornography or somebody having an affair, most people have no clue with how to move forward. Um, and with the physical injury, that magnified everything. Because even if I was trying to work on my mental and my thoughts and that physical pain was such a constant reminder, actually for for years for me. Yeah. So here's my question then for you, because, you know, you and I have both chatted about this a little bit before, you know, so when somebody is dealing with like th- this is such a very very close <clears throat> line you know to walk how do you know like with when you're dealing with the with the jalapeno and you you've dealt with that physical violence right how do you like how do you tell someone to stay in the marriage and keep going when that's happened well i'm a bit stubborn <laughs> I didn't know what to do and I had my whole family and I wouldn't recommend this, although I know it happens probably more often than most people are aware of. I tried to navigate it myself for, I think it was about nine or 10 months. And then things started escalating and ramping up and ramping up and ramping up again. And I was like, whoa, I've got to have help. I can't do this again. I can't be hurt again for one thing. Mm -hmm. And I still was trying to heal from previous injury. And so I did reach out. And that, of course, opens up a whole other can of worms. Um, And I will say when I, and we finally found a therapist because I did say to my husband, we have got to get some help. It's not getting better. Um, I did find a therapist and we have to be really careful with who you get for your therapist because this was not a good match for betrayal trauma. In fact, I found myself again, the therapist saying, you know, you're just going to have to get over it. You know, you're just going to have to forgive him. And he had her wrapped around his, her little finger. He, I was just like, okay, really? And so then I felt like, okay, we need the therapy. I've got my husband to therapy, and this is not a good situation. And it was a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer and guidance. And I think the Lord just put things in my path um, that led me to a therapist that really knew about betrayal trauma. And going back to that safety piece, he really had to work hard on me not saying anything, walking away, being aware of my husband's body language and cues when I, when he would come home or if I was trying to talk with him, because there was a lot of um, gaslighting and stonewalling where he, I would ask and he would pretend like he didn't hear me or ignore me or he'd look the other way, or he would totally go into gaslighting and turn it back on me, whatever it was. And that took, probably quite a few months for me to stop, walk away, and then learning how to use those self-care tools. Because I was one of those moms, you just give, 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 right? And I did do things, Uh, you know, I'm into music and I have animals and I like to go outside, but a lot of times it was just really a lot with my kids or working or doing household things. Um, So learning that self-care and learning um, the boundary to keep me safe because my therapist knew that I was still in danger because my husband was so volatile. He just was not good at regulating his emotions and everything was my fault. And um, so my learning to walk away, even leave the house if I needed, um, took a lot of practice and a lot of self-mastery on my own part, a lot of working on regulating myself and knowing that I, I can only control me 
as much as I really wanted to, you know, have him be different. And again, before this all happened, before everything that led up to that day, I was trying to do everything, you know, even like sacrifice myself to make him happy and nothing happened. Nothing worked is what I'm trying to say, because, well, as we all know, the only one that can help us to be happy is our self and turning to God. You know, your spouse or your partner cannot make you happy. Right. Yeah, it's true. You can't make decisions for someone else. You can't create happiness for someone else. Like none of that works. It's absolutely true. And, you know, but at the same time, too, like if you're sitting in, you know, that uh, and, and you know this because, you know, and we'll be talking with you further also about like healing the nervous system. Right. But the thing is, is um, we get stuck in the amygdala and the amygdala is telling us that fight, flight, freeze or fawn response, you know, and so we're getting stuck in those in that cycle. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying here is that's exactly where you were at, right? In the beginning of this whole situation, that fawn response, where mm-hmm. if I walk on eggshells, if I, if I, if I, if I just step in the exact right spaces, then he'll stay calm. And this sounds so incredibly familiar for women who are dealing with, you know, domestic violence. And to be like full disclosure, I actually don't coach a lot of them. And the reason why is because I personally feel like they need deeper support than what I can give. So like with um, I, like I work a lot with women whose husbands are the mild and the medium. Right. But the jalapenos, they definitely need support, too. So what I'm hearing you say is like, number one, like, let's start leaning on Christ. Right. We really got to lean on Christ to the point where he can tell us whether it's safe to stay or to go. Right. But the second thing is, is to also get some good support for yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Because that support and like and, and you're not the only one that were, who I've heard has said, like, you know, I've gone to a therapist and. They told me that I just needed to get over it or that it was my fault or something. And it's like, who is training these therapists? Like, seriously? Why? Why would you say that to a victim? Like, why? Right? Right in front of their spouse. So then right? it's all my fault again. Right? It was why? <laughs> why would you do that? Why? Uh, anyway, there's a lot of really good therapists out there, too. And you've, you, you found the good one too and so like it's 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 such a really interesting story and you know getting that support getting the the help you need connecting to your savior hearing him is so key but I also found it really interesting when you said that I needed to leave when I needed to leave right Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if that might be one of the keys to know actually if you can stay or to go like how was your how was it leaving? Because I know like a lot of women who try to leave and, and say, you know, I need to do take a break. It's not possible for them with the jalapeno. Right. So how do you feel about boundaries? It's a legitimate question. A lot of people come to me really struggling with this concept. They often feel guilty for setting boundaries or they're not sure about even what a boundary is. You know, they've heard the term, set the boundary, things like that. But that's really confusing for them because it's not something that's well taught in our society nowadays. Right. They know that boundaries are really important to having healthy, constructive, supportive and wonderful relationships. But why? And oftentimes they also know that they feel like their boundaries are being violated, but they can't quite pinpoint what the boundary is that's being violated. That's why I've created the Clarifying and Creating Your Boundaries free PDF. You can find out what your boundaries are, how to tune in to 
what the boundary needs to be and how to effectively create and communicate your boundary so that way you stay in this place that respects you, respects the other person, but also gives you the confidence in your boundaries so that way you stop being gaslighted, disrespected, and unseen. So having your boundaries really clear gives you a voice and also helps the other person stay in accountability with themselves. So that's not a role that you have to take on anymore. So if you are ready to really have clear boundaries, to really understand what your role is in the boundary, and to give yourself some safety and some protection against people that might try to gaslight you or are just being disrespectful, go grab my Creating and Clarifying Your Boundary PDF at AaronAndersonTheTraumaCoach.com. And while you're there, let's schedule a call with me. Come have a chat with me so that way I can really, really help you master this particular skill, creating boundaries, clarifying the boundary, communicating that boundary. And so that way I can also help you have relationships that show up to support you, cherish you, and love you. And I did run into that. Trying to leave the house, probably in the beginning, it wouldn't have even been safe for me to try to leave. Mm -hmm. So it was usually safe for me to go to another room, go outside for a walk in the backyard. Um, and I think one of the hardest, so, and I, I just feel like I'm finally putting even more pieces together over the past six months as, as I've been learning more. I think a couple of key things, well, there's so many key things with being able to actually put a boundary um, with being able to leave. And of course this was years for us um, is being able to create safety. You, you have to have some safe places, some safe people to go to. And sadly, when I first started out, I did not have safe people. <laughs> right. because they told me all the wrong things because, you know, just despite that one therapist, um, who this definitely was not her expertise, you know, other areas I turn, you know, you get the, well, you just need to give them more sex. You just mm -hmm. need to, you must have done something to make them mad. Like, no, you're trying to no. calm down in the moment. And so, and anybody that's been in these situations, you know, most women have tried almost everything, you know, and I will sadly say, even during some of those earlier years, I would even retaliate and yell back, you know, and that didn't help at all. So I definitely learned, well, we don't do that one because that one's definitely not going to ship. So, um, <laughs> And there's so much gaslighting mm -hmm. and your self-worth is so shattered and they make it sound like it's all your fault and you're the problem. And they will tell you, well, you didn't do that. Or you know what? You never said that to me or all these things that make you doubt yourself so much. It's creating that safety where you can hear and see and think clearly. I think that's where support groups are really helpful, you know, groups where you can um, work on your own processing as well as learn the tools for self-care, rebuilding your self-worth and that self-confidence, remembering who you are and that, you know, God does love you. He does not expect you to stay in an abusive relationship. And I'm really grateful that we're hearing that more in um, general conference talks. You know, yeah, we don't have yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, although even my therapist was like, you know, you need to leave, you need to go somewhere else. There's so much fear around being hurt again. And I had little kids at the time. And my thought was, although he had never been abusive to the kids or hurting them, it was me. Mm. Um, I was like, okay, if I leave them, you know, the kids are going to be there and he's mad. And what, what if something happened? And then I would feel guilty. And so I had this hole where I did, I was like, how do I leave? And I have all of these kids. I had six children, you know, and, um, how do you get all six out at the same time? 
you know, without him trying to come between that. And so I was surviving a lot of the times and, um, the other, so there's so many things. The other thing that I found um, in the beginning when everywhere I turned, it was so unsafe and I even had reached out to therapists and that was absolutely horrible. It's like, wow, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> like I'm reaching out for help and I'm getting all these hurt blames. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, like there was no safety. That was not right. safe. And right. so I'm so then you again doubt yourself. And, um, so I did turn to Christ because I was like, okay, I don't know how to do this, but I know that, you know, if I, that you'll help me. Thankfully I had a foundation, you know, and, uh, also in my healing, really anchoring to Christ every day with my prayers and my scripture study and reading a conference talk or listening to it, journaling, because I felt like that was putting my armor on every day so that yeah. I could navigate all the attacks that were coming at me because that this was just one area. And it was like multiple of my communities, my homeschool community. It was like, there was a lot of opposition there. Um, you know, even in some er arenas of the church community, I was like, wow, I'm trying to do good things. And there's just this opposition. So I really felt like I was under That's intense nice. attack by everything. Yeah. There wasn't much safety other than what I created myself. Okay. So then, you know, with therapy, what I was learning was if I could keep myself in alignment and in align with my values, keep myself calm in those jalapeno situations and walk away and do my self-care, that definitely he would de-escalate. Now, here we are 10 years later, and he yeah. has done some of his own work and some therapy and, and group. Um, when I, if I say, you know, if he's getting heated, like, you know, I can't talk anymore about this now, and I will walk away. He, I'm, he, we don't actually have a conversation about this yet. He is doing his own work in that time that we're, we're taking a break. And it's so cool when we come back together that we actually can pick up where we left off and have a better conversation about whatever it was that we were talking about and be able to go forward. So what I find with the basically just detaching from the contention is that then I don't have to clean up all the messes of the guilt and the shame and, you know, have to heal from all the hurtful words or the blaming, you know, and I'm not going to say that I'm perfectly innocent because I've had my own, you know, fiery darts that I'm throwing with my yes. words as well. And then I don't have to feel bad about saying something that I'm like, why did I say that in the moment? You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it's, that's been a beautiful thing here. You know, now where we're at, where we can take a break, come back and we can move forward. And so the recovery you know, can be a few hours instead of like constant spin all the time for, for my brain at least. Yeah. And You know, I got to say, you know, how uh, number one, kudos to you, but also kudos to your husband, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, can I would, like seriously just give him a shout out for just a minute <laughs> because, you know, there is a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. Uh, put on you know everybody in these situations which is really kind of sad and now granted we can kind of see too like if somebody's out there hurting their wives like that's not good but here's your husband who literally has done some major work to cool himself down right and he is no longer doing those things. That's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's huge. I mean, we're talking like Alma the Younger, Saul of Tarsus huge. <laughs> Truly. You know? And like I really want to give him that shout out and give him some respect here because 
that is so hard to do. And it, and you look at the statistics, it doesn't happen very often. No. You know, once somebody gets into those mindsets and, and that anger and, and is the jalapeno, usually it's very, it's it's almost impossible for them. Like it's it's not impossible, but it, it feels impossible for them to to move down to the medium and even the mild, right? Mm-hmm. And here your husband has totally done that. But what yes. I'm hearing you say, you know, is it's also largely due to a lot of the work you yourself have done. And one of the things I talk about with my clients consistently is that if like you can't change another people, uh, another another people. Wow. Where did I learn English? You can't turn. You cannot change another person. Right. You cannot tell them what to think. You cannot tell them how to behave. You cannot tell them what to do and you can't make them do anything. You can't. Mm-hmm. But when you become influential and you start to heal and you start to grow and you start to change and become that influential person, you influence the change, right? Mm -hmm. And here you are, you've done like all of these things to change yourself. And we're not talking about in guilt and in shame. You're saying, no, I decided to change myself for me, not because I wanted my husband to do a certain thing, not because I wanted my kids to do a certain thing, not because I was changing to try to manipulate the situation. I was changing for me. I had my back. And I think that that is key, especially in this situation, because a lot of times women you know, they're like, it's all my fault. I got to change. I got to do this because they're in that fawn response. Right. And it does cause the whole situation to get worse. When you decided to do things for you, to do the self-care, to have your own back, even though sometimes it was a little bit shaky and a little bit unstable, you still did it little bit by little bit staying within that safety realm, right? And you're saying that everything changed. Good. Yeah. And I have to add one more thing in there, that it wasn't just about changing me, really, although I worked so hard to make sure I stayed in alignment with my values, you know, fought to always have the spirit to be with me. And if I didn't, then I needed to walk away and go so I could get regrounded so I could be feeling the spirit again. And the other thing was, and this is before president Nelson's think celestial. Mm -hmm. I would ask, okay, wait, why, 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 why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep staying here? And I really kept saying, because I want to make it to the celestial kingdom. So I had that think celestial there. Um, You know, that's what I was fighting for. I wanted to save my marriage. I wanted to save my family. I knew that the Lord loved my husband, even though he was in a pretty horrible spot. And I knew he loved me. And I believed in the power of the atonement of Christ and that that can heal all of the things that we're going through, whatever challenge that is, you know, whether it's shifting from that jalapeno volatile to the mild, or whether it's working on being on time or, you know, following through with what you said. I mean, we all are working on things. And so I knew he was valued in God's eyes and I was, and even though I didn't know how to bring us together, that is what I would focus on Christ. I'd focus on Christ. Okay. Um, And my favorite scripture is I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And so if my head was just swimming, I would just go on autopilot with that. And I'd say that over and over and pretend like I was focusing on Christ because it was really painful and hurtful and hard. And, ah, and then I found um, a quote that I was like, ah, I love this because this is another witness of hope. If we can work on ourself um, from elder Christofferson, he said, if individually we each put on Christ, then together we can hope to become one. And so 
I think that when we do focus on Christ and we are doing our work and we are striving to become like Christ and learn of him and be like him, that's where we start to see those miracles. And we can find that peace in Christ, which that peace in Christ song is so beautiful. Mm, and we have to not forget. I see so many, not so many. Well, maybe I do. I've had some friends though, who have totally withdrawn and, you know, disconnected from Christ and church and everything and their lives have just spun out of control and crashed. And so each time when I think, oh, you know, sometimes I was like, I just want to go do something bad <laughs> because everything good I'm doing, I'm still having bad things happen. And thankfully I stayed in alignment with my values and I didn't do that because I was like, well, I don't even know what I would do. So I guess I'll just keep trying to do good things. Right. And watching these friends and, you know, if you think your life is bad when you are doing all the good things and trying to stay close to God, I have watched as people disconnect many times their life spirals out of control and it's yeah. way worse. And so for me too, that was another reminder. Ah, well, they did that. I don't want what happened to them. So I'm going to keep moving forward, keep anchoring into the promises that were told in the scriptures staying close to God. And then, you know, now, um, you know, we're to seek and expect miracles. And I, we have permission for that now. <laughs> and I think in a way I was doing that, I kept going, well, you know, these promises are here. If I just keep working on this. I don't know how this is going to happen and come together. And what I found with that, I come like little light switch moments. It's like little light switches it would just flick on because it'd be really bad and we're doing work and working on our recovery and then a light switch would come on and it's better and I'm like well how did that even happen well that's the miracle right there right mm. as we keep doing our work those tender mercies do come yeah they t oh I love that you know um I want to take a just a little quick pause because not all of our listeners are uh Latter-day Saints right a lot of our listeners come from other uh, Christianity sects. And so when we're talking about like President Nelson and we're talking about general conference and stuff like that, that that's all like Latter-day Saint stuff. Right. So when we're talking about. This this stuff, I, it, it, it comes from like our Latter-day Saint beliefs and stuff, but you can still like take so much of what is being said here, like whether you're Latter-day Saint or not and connect this to your own personal beliefs. Cause all of our listeners are Christian, right? Yes. And when we connect to Christ, that is the greatest thing we can do for ourselves, for our families, for everything else that we're dealing with. And that is where we get the miracles. Cause this is totally a miracle. It is mm -hmm. absolutely a miracle. Like one of the greatest miracles is seeing massive quick change in people like mm -hmm. that's one of the most beautiful miracles i can think of it's happened in your home right yeah yes and i'm so beautiful. grateful yeah and you say quick i guess in my whole lifetime it's quick 10 years seems like it was so long right <laughs> and i i i i guess i should definitely you know edit that well not edit but but like explain that comment like you know I'm thinking like Alma the Younger uh Solitarsis you know like it was going from like completely out to destroy Christianity to being like one of the greatest supporters for Christianity right yeah and in just a matter of a few days is all it took for them now right. granted yes 10 years is a long time and I'm not I'm not going to suggest that somebody stick around for 10 years to see if they're going to be okay in their in their situations right I'm not suggesting that at all but what I am saying is that the best thing we can do to become the influential to call upon the miracles is connect to Christ yeah you know and I I totally agree like you know obviously I I've not been through domestic violence um, 
my husband, you know, and I, we've definitely had our struggles and everything, but we have not been through, you know, that, that type of uh, problem in our relationship. However, what we have been through still had me turning towards Christ, Mm -hmm. you know? It was like my lifeline. And when there was nobody else there, even though I was reaching out, I I could find that peace and comfort in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And I was grateful for that. I love it. So here's my question. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um just to kind of wrap things up here. What do you suggest for someone cuz you know like I said we're we're calling this podcast you know cooling the jalapeno, right? Yeah. So what would you suggest for someone who is in that situation? You know, how does she know when to stay? How does she know when to go? Um, And what are the things she must do to make sure that she stays safe no matter what? Yeah. How to know to stay or go. You got to stay close to God. And you have to make sure you're safe. So if you're seeing signs in your husband that things are safe, okay, I can stay. If things are escalating and getting worse and not safe, you've got to go. And whether that's separated until he works on his self to calm down and cool down, or if that's divorce and that's between, you know, you, you and God, the other thing Lots and lots of self-care to rebuild yourself, to rebuild your self-esteem and your confidence and your worth and remembering who you are, anchoring into your identity and learning to regulate your, your nervous system, which we'll talk about at another time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very important with learning to ground yourself as well as learning that self-mastery, that ability to, no matter what is going on, to stay within your values and stay calm. And as me, I had to learn to zip my mouth closed and walk away because then I'm not feeding into the contention. I'm not adding to this whirlwind of emotions. I'm disconnecting in that moment. And if you can have a few brief statements like, you know what, I think we need to take a break and talk about this later. Or you could even say, I'm not doing very well. Now, if they're like not going to let you walk away, you can always pull out the, I've got to go to the bathroom. Most people will not say that you can't go to the bathroom. And so then you can calm down in there, have some time away there, um, have an escape plan ready, you know, where you know your, your keys and your purse are and your phone and you are able to just grab it and leave if you need. And I find that you have to practice this over and over of what you're going to do in those heated situations so that you have that mental preparation before. So when it happens, you have your plan, which is your safety plan to create safety for yourself, to walk away, whether it's the bedroom or to go for a walk or to leave the house so that you are not put in danger under any situation, because when you've added in that physical injury, it is, it just magnifies everything for healing and recovery at between with yourself and with, with your spouse. So at all costs, keep yourself safe. And I hear women sometimes say, if, if, if he would just hit me, then I'd have an an excuse to leave. And I'm an example of, I did not leave. So most of the time, I don't know most, I don't know what the statistics is, but many women still don't leave. So just because they, they hit you and you've got a bruise doesn't mean that you're going to leave. So you need to, okay, safety, boundaries, and all of these things are processes as you work your own recovery. And one of the non-negotiables is, you know, no violence. And that's, that's like a deal breaker. And I even know that for myself when I say that, and you have to create safety at all costs 
avoid any situation of physical injury at all costs. Yes, I agree. And, you know, you mentioned a couple other really interesting points here, and I want to say key points. And I think this is going to also be uh, very telltelling whether you can stay, whether you need to go, any of that kind of stuff when it comes to your ha- your jalapeno husband. And number one is the fact that you were still able to at least walk away to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the jalapeno will follow to the bathroom and like he's just, he's he's just going to hurt someone. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I like I think if the jalapeno shows some restraint, that's a good thing. You know, and they don't. Mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where that's where my therapist worked with me to not get to that point at all. And I would watch the body language of my spouse. And if he was doing any of those things, like ignoring me or looking away or gaslighting or minimizing that I did not engage any further, I would turn and walk away. And that took me a lot of self-mastery and time to actually get to that point. Um, because I kept thinking, well, if I just try a little harder, no, he is not in a place. He does not want to talk to you. And I would have to actually just walk away and have my plan of what I would go do because it's really hard to do that. Again, it took a lot of practice. And so navigating those signs that you have noticed that lead up to those volatile situations so that you don't get to that. If any of this is happening, you either leave or go to your safe place. You have the separation. If you think that there would be any following or restraint and, and these are the, um, the, the traits and, and signs that lead up to that, then you just leave. And what happens is they either then shift and be like, Oh, okay, well, I need to figure this out because I do want her here with me or things will continue to escalate, which is another sign that, okay, then you just, you stay away. You stay at a safe distance. That might mean leaving. Yeah. And you don't come back until they're calm and until they have the tools to help them to regulate because otherwise it is dangerous and it is not fun. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's something I, I got to tell you, I'm so glad you came on to the, the podcast because I do feel like this is something that needs to be talked about a lot more. And you're going to hear my little girl in the background. Sorry, guys. She's two. She doesn't understand, you know, boundaries yet. But it is really, really important that we do understand the differences, that this is something that does need to be talked about, that this is something that needs to be shared because too often like um you know i know a few years ago there was a lady in my community that was uh killed by her boyfriend right because of the domestic violence and had she been able to know what the signs are you know i think that would be really key so actually i have another question for you yeah would you be willing to come back and also do a podcast about the signs to watch for with the jalapeno. Yes. Because I think that's going to be key. Okay. I so love that. We're, we're going to have Markel back for sure, everyone. Um, because I I do feel like this is something that is very key, something that needs to be discussed. Mm-hmm. Um and how to in how to calm down the jalapeno and how to navigate that whole situation. So she'll be back. We're also going to be talking with her eventually about how to calm the nervous system and heal the nervous system. So, yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up with Markel. (laughs) Great. Thank you. And I hope this is helpful to all those listeners, um, you know, hopeful for how to generate safety as well as um, hopeful that there is help and there is hope for people to recover if they will do the work Mm -hmm. and and show up for themselves as well as for their, their spouse. Truly. Totally. Well, Markel, thank you so much for coming back with us. You guys pay attention to the podcast. She will be with us again. And then also let us know if you guys have some questions that either I or Markel can answer for you. 
And until the next time, guys, we will see you on the other side. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I've got a question for you. Have you joined my free Facebook group or Instagram page yet? If you haven't, go and do that. And this is the reason why. I always post my freebies, updated information, and all kinds of goodies for my community in that page. I'm also really active. I post videos. I answer questions. So if you guys really, really want to get in and interact with me, go like me on Facebook. Go join my group, The Other Side of the Struggle, Healing from Betrayal Trauma. Come find me on Instagram, Erin Anderson, Betrayal Trauma Coach. And come follow me because I always have something good there just for you, my audience. And I love connecting with you there. I also post any time that I have groups going on. I talk sometimes about my programs. So if you guys are interested in working with me or even just following me and getting as much free content as you possibly can, go hang out in my group. Go connect with the ladies that are there. Um, also come and join Immune and Unashamed uh, for those married couples that are following me because in that group, me and my business partner, Kaisen Kid, are also talking and offering some great content. Hey guys, thanks so much for hanging out with me today and listening in on this podcasting episode. Don't forget to tune in.